I'm Michelle, and welcome back to the Canadian History of Chronology channel. Today's episode, number 16, puts us in the middle of both the Fur Wars and the Iroquois Wars. The Iroquois, too, wanted in on the fur trade. And to say the least, this is a very tumultuous and significant time in the history of Canada. But here's a question for you. What started the Fur Wars anyways? Well, it was the beaver. Yes, you heard me right, the beaver, Canada's national symbol. But why? Because beaver felt hats were all the rage in Europe. They were the high fashion of the day. And by this time, the Europeans had virtually wiped out their own beaver populations. So New World beaver pelts were in high demand. Other animals like marten, otter, mink, fox, and wolf were also trapped but it was the beaver that was central to the economy of the New World. For now, the French originally controlled the northern fur trade in the New World, but in 1670, the English decided to make a go at it for themselves. And it was at this time, and in support of the need for furs, that the French decided that a better route with larger ships could be found by going north. The St. Lawrence River was great, but required long journeys in small canoes with lots of portages. Bigger ships would mean bigger loads and dealing directly with the Cree natives in the north. And as a bonus, they would be able to cut out the Montreal middlemen. Well, two French coureurs de bois named Redisson and Grosselier proposed such a plan. Unfortunately, the French courts had no interest and the merchants of Montreal refused to be bypassed as middlemen. So what could Radisson and Grosselier do? Well, they traded sides and joined the English. In 1668, an English consortium funded two ships, the Eaglet with Radisson on board, but she had to turn back. The second ship, the Nonsuch with Grosselier on board, did make it to James Bay. The traders built themselves a makeshift post, and by the spring, they were shocked and awed when some 300 Cree fur traders arrived. Grosselier traded with the Cree and returned to London in 1669 with a cargo hold jammed full of furs. The expedition was a success. Well, this voyage of the Nonsuch would change the course of North American history forever. Within days of Grosselier arriving in London, investors lined up and a royal charter was immediately issued for the Company of Adventurers, who were given exclusive rights over the lands that drained into Hudson's Bay. King Charles of England even went further by proclaiming that all gentlemen's hats must be made of beaver skins. This was great for the fur trade, but very bad for the beaver. The Great Basin around Hudson Bay was named Rupert's Land and covered about 40% of present-day Canada. The territory was later expanded to the Rocky Mountains, then to the Pacific Ocean, and then further into the Arctic in the north. Then in 1670, the Hudson's Bay Company, the HBC, was founded by the English. And interestingly, the HBC is most likely the oldest commercial enterprise in the world as it still exists to this day at over 350 years old. Now in retaliation to this English success, the French formed La Compagnie du Nord, the Company of the North in 1682. And then in 1686, the French went on the offensive and performed what is considered Canada's first commando raid. Led by Pierre de Troyes, voyageurs and military officers traveled west for 12 weeks along the Ottawa River, then north through dense forests to James Bay. Their plan? To capture three of the HBC's forts, Moose Factory, Rupert House, and Fort Albany. The English were caught completely by surprise, and all three forts were captured by the French. A sidebar to this French mission was for the French to capture any coureur de bois who had sided with the English. And at the top of their hit list was Pierre Radisson. His old partner, Médard de Grosselier, had returned to the French earlier in 1676, so he was safe. 
So now the French had control of the lower Hudson's Bay and James Bay, and over the years there would be many ownership back and forth between the French and the English. But an upcoming French-English showdown was on the horizon, for sure. For now, the English would focus on the Hudson's Bay, Newfoundland, and the Mid-Atlantic Sea Coast, while the French would focus on the St. Lawrence River, the Great Lakes, and Acadia. Back home in England, the HBC Charter required that the English explore the interior, but those with the HBC in the New World were more interested in trade and profits. Finally, the HBC sent Henry Kelsey in 1690. His job was to make contact and establish trading relationships with the local indigenous peoples he would meet in the interior. He spent two years traveling with his Cree companions and became the first European to reach the Canadian Plain and was amazed by the vast herds of bison he witnessed. Unfortunately, the 8th BC made no use of Kelsey's discoveries and all was basically forgotten. The French, however, were much more enthusiastic about the interior. In 1682, René Robert, Cavalier de la Salle, on behalf of France, followed the Great Lakes west, then went down the Mississippi River, and then all the way to the Gulf of Mexico. At the Mississippi Delta, La Salle raised the royal arms of France and claimed all lands that drained into the Mississippi in the name of King Louis XIV of France. He named these lands in Louisiana after his king. By now, the Iroquois had set up their own trading colonies along the north shore of Lake Ontario and began trading furs with the Ojibwa. This meant that the French were now trespassing on Iroquois territory. So the Iroquois, armed by their English allies to the south, began attacking fur-lading canoes on their way to the French. Another major concern for the French was that the Iroquois were again reaching a troubling level of power. In 1684, the French launched a, a raid deep into Iroquois territory, but failed. Then in 1687, the French seized 40 Onondaga envoys, part of the Iroquois Confederacy that came to negotiate a ceasefire and sent them back to France as slaves. The French then initiated a massive invasion with several thousand men into the heart of the Seneca homeland, also a part of the Iroquois Confederacy, and burnt villages, farmlands, and desecrated graves. The Iroquois retaliated. In 1689, in what is now called the Lachine Massacre, the Iroquois attacked the small French community of Lachine on the island of Montreal. Two dozen settlers were killed and 60 more were taken prisoner and executed. This marked the beginning of nearly 10 years of terror for the settlers of New France. After this came the clash of egos. On the French side was the governor of New France, Louis de Baud, Comte de Frontenac, and on the English side was the New England adventurer, William Phipps. Frontenac was originally appointed governor of New France in 1672, but was recalled 10 years later in 1682. But when he heard of the 1689 Lachine Massacre, he begged to return to New France. Back in New France, Frontenac realized that the Iroquois were not interested in peace. And worse than this was that they were being armed and encouraged by the English settlers to the south. So in the winter of 1689, Frontenac sent Canadiens and native warriors against the English. At the Shenactady settlement, they massacred men, women, and children, killing 60. But this plan backfired for Frontenac. This did not bring the English to their knees, but rather strengthened their resolve to fight the French. In 1690, the New Englanders sent a force under William Phipps to Acadia. They captured Port Royal and destroyed everything in their path. After this success, Phipps started to plan his attack on Quebec. Under his command, Phipps had more than 30 ships and 2,300 armed men. He blockaded the St. Lawrence River and sent a message to Frontenac to surrender. But it wasn't Phipps' blockade that won. It was the weather. Winter, to be more precise. 
Phipps did try to take Quebec but failed, and within three weeks, the English forces had to return to Boston. Then came Iberville. Iberville was the answer to the five Kirk brothers that captured Quebec and took Samuel de Champlain prisoner back in 1628. There were actually 12 Lemoyne brothers from the Seigneurie farm near Montreal. But son number three, Pierre, was the most famous and feared and is generally referred to by his title, not his name. Pierre was titled Sieur de Breville. Interestingly, Pierre and two of his brothers were actually part of the commando raid against the English at Hudson's Bay earlier and went on to lead four more military expeditions against the English in Hudson's Bay between 1688 and 1697. It was quite accomplished. Between Iberville's fourth and fifth expeditions to Hudson Bay, he was sent south to what is now called Maine to attack the English who were harassing natives trading furs with Acadia. Iberville sacked the fort and took the English as prisoners. He then looked towards Newfoundland. The French had a base on the west side of the Avalon Peninsula at Placentia. The English were on the east side of the peninsula. The English cannons pointed out to sea as no one would ever consider attacking from the inland, so they thought. It was winter, and Iberville had a secret weapon that none of the island's inhabitants had ever seen before. Snowshoes. Iberville and his men destroyed 36 settlements, killed 200 settlers, took more than 700 prisoners, destroyed 90 vessels, and pillaged a fortune in dried cod. But Iberville wasn't done. In 1697, he sailed into Hudson Bay to take the York factory from the English. On this voyage, he became separated from his fleet and arrived in the bay alone. He saw three ships approaching and figured his fleet had finally joined him, but no, they were English ships, a heavily armed Royal Navy frigate and two heavily armed merchantman ships of the Hudson's Bay Company. Iberville had one ship with 44 cannon against the English's three ships with 124 guns. But Iberville did not flee or surrender. He went on the attack, and against all odds, Iberville and his crew beat all three of the English ships, and when the French fleet finally did arrive, he went on to capture the English York factory, which would remain in French hands for the next 16 years. Iberville was finished with Hudson Bay, but not finished with his adventures. He turned his attention to the self and helped launch French colonies in Louisiana and in what is now Alabama. The French now held Acadia, the St. Lawrence, and the Great Lakes, and from Hudson Bay to the Mississippi Delta. Now, by 1700, the tide had turned against the Iroquois. Their population had been diminished, their warriors depleted, and their territory was overextended. The Algonquin and the French had pushed the Iroquois back to their original territory, south of Lake Ontario. And by 1701, the Iroquois, along with 39 other nations, signed a peace treaty with New France at Montreal. The Iroquois agreed to maintain neutrality in any future English-French conflicts while the French allowed the Iroquois to trade in the interior. The Iroquois Wars were over. Well, that's it for the short history of our trip into the Fur Wars. Please stay tuned for the next episode, episode 17, The Fall of New France. Now remember, at any time, feel free to leave comments or questions below and I'll do my best to respond to them all. And please, be a true Canadian and be polite. And if you like this content, please subscribe to my channel and give it a thumbs up. And hit the bell if you'd like to be notified of any new content. Thanks everyone and have a great day. Whoa!